I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing during my PhD, which has been around virtual reality. Virtual reality, or VR, has been around for a long time, but only in the past five to 10 years has it really taken off. Uh, all the advances in the graphics, the field of view, the tracking technology have now led us to having commercial VR headsets, which makes this time a really exciting time to be doing this type of research. There are a lot of applications for VR beyond just gaming. Uh, for example, you can experience what it's like uh, to, uh, for example, go on the International Space Station and have new experiences that you couldn't have otherwise. You can create new artifacts. Uh, one of my favorite applications is 3D modeling in VR. It, ma it makes a lot of sense to create a 3D object in a 3D environment instead of trying to map that onto a 2D display, assuming you have good interactions and interfaces. And finally, there are a lot of learning op opportunities in VR that really take advantage of our innate spatial reasoning skills. Here I'm showing an example of uh, exploring a 3D molecular structure, but there are a lot of examples of training simulations for different fields as well. But when we think about what the person, the user, is experiencing in these applications, visually they're seeing a lot of exciting content. But in terms of what they're doing with their hands, at best they're holding a controller like this that once in a while vibrates in their hand. So there's really a gap in how much haptic rendering we're able to do in commercial VR hardwares today. But when we think about how we interact in the physical world with physical objects, when we trace a surface, we feel its texture. When we grasp an object, we feel its stiffness, its weight. And all of these haptic feedback and tactile feedback that we receive inform how we improvise in our interactions and how we manipulate objects. But in VR, when we put on the VR headset, we see some virtual content. If we reach out to touch that object, there's nothing really there for us to feel. So this is the problem that I wanted to address in my PhD. And the vision that I started off with was, what if we have a swarm of robots, swarm of drones, uh, kind of orchestrating this haptic interaction? What if we could predict what the user was interested in interacting with, and then one of these drones would fly look for either a 3D printed model or um, some even everyday object that could be used as proxy for that virtual object and present it to the user so that when the user interacts with virtual content, they have a physical object, a physical surface to interact with. So I, I want to talk about one application of where this could be useful. For example, if you're doing some e-commerce application, you want to buy some piece of clothing, it's important for you to be able to kind of reach out, feel the texture of the material, and pick up that object and feel its weight and, and have those types of kind of haptic feedback in your interactions. So I set out to make this happen. I first started with just one drone. So this is a racing quadcopter that I've enclosed in a meshed cage so it's safe to interact with. You're not gonna uh, hurt yourself, hopefully. <laughs> And I integrated this with the VR system. So with the virtual shopping experience that I showed you earlier, where we were able to track the user's headset, their hand, the drone, and then depending on which parts of the virtual scene we could render physically with the drone, we would send waypoints to the drone to fly to that position. But when it came to actually uh, implementing this and trying it out with users, we ran into, whoops, a lot of issues. Um, the main one being the position accuracy of the drone became a huge problem. As you can see here, the person interacting is not able to see the drone itself. So if the drone is not positioned precisely where it needed to be in space, then no haptic interaction would happen. And this problem is not really unique to the system or this haptic system. It's kind of it, it happens across a range of haptic devices. So haptic devices include controllers that I showed you earlier in this talk. There could be haptic gloves or encountered type haptic devices. This is a family of devices that um, the drone actually falls within this category, but traditionally they've been these um, 
grounded robotic arms that move around in space and present themselves to the user whenever they encounter a surface. And what's great about them is that you don't have to hold a controller or wear anything, but you are still presented with a real physical surface to interact with. And all of these devices have limitations. For example, the accuracy in terms of how they're positioned in space or where they, they provide the haptic sensation could not be um, as accurate as we would want it to be. There could be speed, uh, speed limitations where there may be delays in the haptic rendering or the speed of the robot moving around may not be sufficient to support uh, fast interactions. And fi finally, the resolution of the haptic rendering could also uh, not be sufficient in that um, we might, might not be able to render very detailed surfaces. So in my work, I draw on this insight that our perception is not perfect. So we don't need these haptic devices to be perfect. And to demonstrate what I mean by our perception is not uh, perfect, I'm going to ask you all to try to touch your fingers together, your index finger, above your head without looking at it. I see a lot of kind of not successful attempts. And this is an example of you relying on your sense of proprioception, the forces in your arms, to tell you where your finger is in space and not having enough information to do this correctly. And so what I'm trying to con uh, convey here is that we don't need to make these haptic systems really complex and expensive when our perception is not perfect. And I hope to demonstrate this in my work. And uh, what I do is that I argue that we can leverage the limits of our perception to make these devices appear as if they worked better than they actually do. So today, I'll be talking to you about three main projects. The first one, I'll go back to the project where I use drones for haptics in VR. And I'll talk to you about how I leveraged uh, users, limitation of users' perception to make these drones appear as if they were accurately positioned in space, even though they weren't. In the second project, I'll talk about um, a different haptic device, a tabletop robot that we used for haptics. And I'll talk about how I used Visio Haptic Illusions um, to make these devices appear as if they were, they were faster and moving faster in space than they actually are. And in the third project, uh, I use the shape display for haptics. A shape display is a matrix of actuated pins that go up and down, and they can render different 2.5D surfaces. And I'll talk about how I used illusions to make these surfaces appear as if they were higher resolution than they actually are. So I will use this slide as my outline for the talk. I'll walk you through these three projects, we, which use illusions for creating this sort of realistic haptic rendering. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about how by trading off the sense of realism, we actually can gain even more benefits and can make uh, interactions uh, better and give people, extend people's abilities. So I'll present an example of this sort of beyond real interaction in the context of locomotion and present a higher level uh, framework for talking about and describing um, these sort of interactions. So in my work, I hope to demonstrate that by understanding the limits of human sensory integration and motor control, we can design effective VR interactions that can create the illusion of improved haptic sensation and extend users' abilities beyond what is possible in the real world. Um, so I'll start off by talking more about the drone project going back to the system that I described earlier. So in this project, we were able to create that kind of safe to touch meshed drone. Uh, we were able to add um, magnets around the drone so we could attach different fabrics to it. We could uh, attach 3D printed props to the drone. And also the drone itself could land and act as kind of a passive box or prop for the user to grasp and move around. So you might be thinking, would people even feel comfortable being that close to a drone and touching it and moving it around? So this is what we studied before doing this project, was um, 
trying uh, to learn more about this. So we ran a user study with 24 participants. This was uh, between, uh, sorry, within subjects study design. So our uh, users interacted, sorry, it was a between subjects study design. So our users, half of them, um, interacted with a normal drone, and the other half interacted with an earlier version, or early, earlier prototype of our safe to touch drone. This was an elicitation study, meaning that we gave people visual prompts to accomplish certain tasks, but we didn't tell them how to do those tasks. And we found that more than half of our participants in the safe to touch drone condition actually instinctively went cl really close to the drone, picked it up, touched it in order to kind of make it take off or go further or come closer to them. But in the other condition with the normal drone, most people used uh, voice commands or mid uh, kind of hand gestures to make the drone land or take off. So this was encouraging for us to know that maybe people are OK uh, once you have kind of that meshed cage around a drone to be that close um, with the drone interacting with it through touch. So let's return to uh, the problem we were having with this drone. Ideally, what we wanted was for the drone to be positioned exactly at the contact point where we were able to provide the haptic sensation. But in reality, what happened because of the mesh cage and all the props that we had attached to the drone was that there was this slight offset um, of how closely we were able to get the drone positioned in space. And more problematically, sometimes the drone drifted away where, from where it needed to be. So this is what we were trying to kind of address and fix in our interaction. And we were inspired by this work um, that was presented on haptic retargeting. So in this project, researchers used one passive cube to represent three virtual cubes by kind of creating this sort of haptic illusion. Um, and this is a really cool trick. Once you try it, you'll, once you take off your headset, you're really surprised to see there was only one physical, physical cleat cube in front of you. And it's a really nice kind of magic trick. But in order to take it from a passive block from the user sitting at a very specific distance from the, the object, we had to kind of go back and think about how does it actually work, why does it work, and how do we take that and apply it to a system where the user is moving around, the drone is not the static object, but also moving around, and how can we apply this sort of illusion um, on the go? So we looked at how the brain plans and control, controls movement. So imagine you want to reach out and touch an object. What happens is that uh, in the brain, your intent is converted to motor command signals. This is sent to your body, which results in your arm moving forward. But this movement is subject to noise, uh, unpredictable changes in the environment, and other factors that the brain has to kind of have a way of estimating how far it went and, and what happened in this stage. And it does so by looking at the sensory feedback that it receives. You visually see your hand moving in space, but also you feel the forces in your muscles and joints, as you saw earlier, um, that gives you information about the current state of your hand. The brain is then able to compare that to where it expected your hand to be, and by, you, by kind of um, looking at the difference, it's able to correct and compensate for the error and allow you to actually reach and touch the goal that you're trying to reach to. So what we did in this project was we used um, this knowledge of how we reach in space and how uh, we can kind of trick the brain into uh, correcting its course to improve the perceived position uh, accuracy of drones through a dynamic version of this haptic retargeting that I showed, showed you earlier. So what we did is as the user reached out to touch the drone or the contact point, if the drone drifted away, we would offset gradually their hand in the opposite direction. So what would happen is that the user is getting visual information about what happened, and as a result, will try to move their hand further left to compensate for this error. So the outcome is that the user ends up making contact in the real world with the drone at a slightly different position than where their virtual hand is positioned in the, uh, in the virtual system. And if this difference is small enough, they don't even notice that they're doing this because it's happening so gradually and the, and the offset is not large enough. <laughs> 
And the reason that this works is that we have different sensory signals that we're using, but not all of them are as reliable and certain as the other ones. So you tried this earlier where you weren't quite able to touch your fingers. Now I'm going to ask that you do this in front of you, where you can use your sense of vision. I see that most people, I see one person that wasn't successful, but <laughs> most people, I feel like, were able to do this. And that's because your sense of vision is a lot more reliable and less noisy than your sense of proprioception in terms of giving you information about where your hand is, is in space. And your brain knows this. So when there's a conflict in sensory information, it actually weighs your visual information over your proprioception and kind of ignores what it feels through the muscles. And this is called the visual dominance effect. So by using this sort of dynamic haptic retargeting, we were able to make this drone appear as if it was positioned accurately in space by kind of compensating for this uh, position and accuracy gradually throughout our interaction. So we had um, nine participants come into our lab and interact with this system. All of them were successful in terms of reaching the textile or reaching the object. But we also uncovered a lot of kind of failure cases and limitations where this haptic retargeting was not as successful as we had hoped. Um, and, and there were a few uh, kind of variables that influenced this. The first one was the speed of the user's hand. If people reached out really quickly towards the, the contact point they were interested in interacting with, we didn't have enough time to kind of gradually offset their hand. And same with the distance that they had to this. If they were really close to the target, we didn't have enough kind of time and distance to gradually offset their hand without them noticing. Another variable was how the drone was drifting. If it moved really rapidly or if it moved in different directions, it was hard for us to uh, gracefully add this kind of haptic retargeting Whereas if it was kind of gradually drifting in the same direction, we were very successful at kind of retargeting the user's hand. So in the second project I want to talk to you about, we were able to kind of take this understanding and um, decide when it made sense to add haptic retargeting and when it didn't. So I will talk to you about this project, which was led by Eric Gonzalez, uh, who's defending in a few months, so you should come to his defense as well. Um, but in this project, we used a tabletop robot instead of the drones for haptics. And so the user was interacting with a control panel, and different buttons and knobs uh, were uh, placed on this robot that could move around. And the problem here was that the robot was not fast enough uh, to kind of keep up with the user's interactions as they were kind of trying to touch different buttons on the control panel. So we were trying to use um, these haptic retargeting techniques to improve the perceived speed of these tabletop robots. So the first thing that we did was we looked at um, how the user was their gaze pattern and their hand velocity to be able to predict where we think they were going to touch. Then we used existing models of uh, end to end kind of goal directed reach to be able to predict how long it would take um, for the user to arrive there. So we used their hand velocity profile to estimate the arrival time of their finger to that target position. We also knew the limitations of our robot. We knew how fast it could move. So we were able to predict how close it was possible for it to get to that target position during that time window. And so by having this information, we were able to gradually add this haptic retargeting and allow the user to kind of meet the robot halfway. So they were able to make contact with the virtual button they were interested in in the virtual world. But in the physical world, their hand was making contact with the robot at a slightly different position. And so by adding this predictive layer, we were able to have more information about how long 
we have to add this retargeting and how far the dis distance between the goal and where we could get the robot to was. And if that was more than where we thought people would notice the illusion, we would choose not to apply any haptic retargeting. So we were able to say, these are the cases where this would work, and these are the cases where it makes sense to just accept the fact that we might have the robot kind of arrive with a delay. So now I want to switch gears to a third project. So the first two that I talked about was more around kind of reaching out to touch an object. And now I want to talk about once you arrive at that kind of uh, contact area, what, how can we use these sort of haptic illusions to make the, the renderings appear um, as if they were working better? So in this pro project, we used a shape display, which is a matrix of actuated pins that can go up and down and they can render different kind of 2.5D surfaces for people to interact with. So this sort of haptic um, interaction is called contour following. So you've already arrived at the surface and you're kind of exploring that surface. And the problem here, as you can see, is that the shape display is relatively uh, low resolution. And the reason for that is every single pin has a motor that's actuating it up and down. And when you try to miniaturize these uh, uh, motors, they get really expensive. So we were thinking of how can we use these kind of haptic illusions to make these surfaces appear as if they were higher resolution instead of kind of increasing the complexity and cost of the device itself. So we tried two methods that I will talk to you about today. The first one we call angle redirection. So here you can see that I'm rendering a line at an angle and the pins don't really line up that nicely. It's very uneven for me to kind of trace that line. Um, it's really kind of like a rasterization problem of kind of getting that onto the shape display. So what we do instead is render a horizontal line and apply the same kind of re redirection trick that I showed you earlier, but in the context of the user's finger, um, so that they visually see the same line at an angle, but physically they're following a horizontal line. And this, this really helped kind of have the pins lined up really nicely and have kind of a smooth uh, surface to interact with. So we wanted to see how far we could push this, because as you can imagine, if the angle of the line is um, really large, you might start to really feel the forces in your arms that would give this information away that, that we're applying an illusion and kind of warping the space. So we ran a user study to find this kind of detection threshold of what angle uh, we could, uh, how far we could take, take this interaction. We used the method of constant stimuli, meaning that we gave people a lot of repeated samples. And some of the samples had no illusion, so we were rendering the line exactly at an angle that they were visually seeing in VR, and some of them had an illusion. So visually, people were uh, kind of following a line at an angle, but in the physical world, they were following a horizontal line. And we gave people um, very extreme versions of these two to make sure that they understood what we me meant by an illusion um, and what we meant by no illusion. And then we did the study of a uh, method of constant stimuli where they saw uh, many repeated samples uh, for different angles and we asked them if we were using an illusion or not. So it was kind of a yes or no um, answer. And this is the data from that study uh, from 19 participants that we've fit a psychometric curve. So the x-axis is the angles that we've tried. Uh, so we tried 5, 10, 25, 35, and 45 degrees. The y-axis is the ratio of answers for the same participant in terms of how many, uh, what percentage they were able to recognize that we were applying an illusion. So you can see at the beginning, uh, people thought we weren't applying an illusion, even though all these data points had an illusion. And later on, they were able to kind of pick up on the more we increased the angle, they noticed that we were applying this illusion. So this point um, here is at 50%, so 0.5 ratio. This is uh, kind of the point where people is start, are starting to just notice that we are doing something. So f half of the time they say we were using an illusion, half of the time they didn't across these repeated samples. So it's kind of um, like a guessing 
And 75% um, or 0.75 ratio is uh, normally used in these kind of psychological psychometrics tests as the detection threshold. Of, this is the point where most people can tell you confidently that um, we, we are applying an illusion. And we found that this was around 50 degrees for, for our example. So we wanted to run a second study where we didn't tell people what we were doing. We didn't tell them that we were applying an illusion. And we wanted to stick below this kind of 50 degree angle and see if it actually helped to make the shape display be better at kind of rendering haptics. So we ran a second study where this time we used um, the method of two alternative force choice tasks. So we did, told people that we had two different shape displays, even though we only had one shape display. Half, uh, one sample had the case with the illusion, so we were rendering a line at an angle, but they were touching a horizontal line. And in the other sample, they were uh, kind of following the line at the angle that it was. And we randomized the order of these two. And we asked them which, which shape display they thought was uh, higher resolution, uh, smoother, and which one they preferred. Again, they didn't see that this was the same shape display. They thought we had two different shape displays. I'm going to show you the results for 40 degrees, which is the highest angle that we tried below those kind of illusion thresholds. Um, this is aggregated data across all 19 participants, across all repeated samples. And the majority of people thought that the case with the illusion was the higher resolution shape display, the one that was smoother as they interacted with it, and the one that they preferred. And we found the similar results for the other angles that we tried, like 10, 20, and 30 degrees. So by applying this illusion, we were able to make the shape display appear as if it uh, worked better than it actually did. A second method that we tried was uh, scaling up. So here, instead of rendering a line, I'm rendering a semisphere. And as you can see, the surface is kind of uneven. There are only a few pins in this area. So it's not a very pleasant experience. You, your finger almost get, gets caught in these pins. But what we can do instead is we can scale up the rendering on the shape display and change the speed of the user's finger as they're tracing the surface. So if you're familiar with the concept of control to display ratio in, in the mouse when you're interacting with the computer, this is what we're doing. We're basically changing the user's CD ratio of their virtual finger as they're tracing the surface. So we're able to create this illusion of uh, more pins per area. We did the same kind of two-step study for this. I won't get into the details, but again, we did these repeated samples where people experience some without the illusion and some with, and we drew the psychometric curve, and we found that given the specific dimensions of our shape display, we were able to scale up um, the rendering by around 1.9 times of the original. We ran the same follow-up study where uh, we gave people two shape displays, even though it was the same shape display and one just had the illusion. We asked them with which one the case with the illusion or not was the one that they preferred, thought was higher resolution and smoother. So I'll show you uh, the highest scale factor that we tried, which was 1.8, uh, below that kind of threshold of when people started to notice that we were uh, kind of changing the speed of their finger. We found, again, that majority of people aggregated across all samples and all participants uh, thought the case with illusion was higher resolution, smoother, and what they preferred. So in the other interaction, I told you that for every angle, the angle redirection wor worked pretty effectively. But for scaling up, we didn't find that at lower scale factor it worked as well. So this is the result for 1.2 times uh, the scale factor, and as you can see, we, the, the results were not as strong. And this makes sense. The more you scale up, the more pins per area you end up with. And so people feel like that surface is higher resolution, smoother, and also what they preferred. So in this project, uh, I showed you two um, kind of haptic illusion interactions. One was angle redirection, and the other one was scaling up that helped us improve the perceived resolution of shape displays. And this allowed us to kind of have smooth surfaces as we did renderings and also gave us a chance to uh, render more details by scaling up the, the interaction. So I, I talked to you 
uh, about these three projects that used illusions for realistic haptic rendering. And really what we're doing in these projects is that we're remapping users' movements in VR. So if I kind of place that across this axis of how true to life um, the interaction is, which is known as the Verity Continuum, if we were to do what most VR interactions would be, where you try to render user's hand exactly where the real hand is, you will end up on kind of the side of this uh, continuum, where these are known as reality-based interactions. You're trying to do your best to render user's hands exactly where they, they are positioned. So what we were doing in these three projects is that we're slightly offsetting user's hand position um, to allow us to create these sort of illusions that make these devices appear as if they worked better. And you can imagine we could do other things that would fall in this category. We could maybe extend the user's arm ever so slightly. If your ar virtual arm is slightly longer, you're probably not going to notice to some extent. And these interactions uh, work great for kind of maintaining this idea of realistic interaction. But also, I realized that we were so caught up and focused on identifying these thresholds of when do these illusions break and making sure that we stuck below these thresholds to maintain that kind of realistic interaction. So in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about what we gain when we trade off this realism and when we accept the fact that people's perception is adaptable and flexible and they can learn to operate in really warped spaces where your hand may be totally somewhere else and you can still be trained and learn how to operate in that warped space. And you could also learn to have a different body representation where your arm could extend much further and you can grab really far objects and, and that you could learn how to use that, that interaction. So in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about these um, interactions, which we've called beyond real interactions. So I'll be referring to real world and real interaction a lot. And I just want to clarify that I don't mean that there is this objective real world that's separate from the user's objective, uh, subjective mental model. But I'm really just referring to what people can perceive through their sensory information uh, without the use of technology. So I'll talk about how we can use these beyond real interactions for extending uh, our abilities beyond what we can do in the real world. And I'll talk about um, an example of this in the context of locomotion, and then I'll present a kind of like a higher level conceptual framework. And locomotion refers to kind of walking around in space. And this has only been possible in the past few years where now we have untethered VR headsets that allow us to kind of walk around in VR as well. But if you think about walking as a very slow form of locomotion, and we can do so much better in VR if we kind of accept the fact that we could remap users' movements. So this started uh, from my internship back in 2018 at Microsoft Research, where we were looking at how we can make people walk more efficiently in VR. And this technique that we explored was called uh, I'm a giant, or kind of turning into a giant. So basically, we were um, scaling up people's body representation, which as a result allowed us to let them walk much faster. So here, I'm walking 10 times faster in VR, but by kind of embodying this uh, avatar that's 10 times my body size. And we ran a user study, and we found that this was really easy for people to use. We had these um, targets that they had to go to and stop, and we found that they were able to uh, stop really accurately at those target positions. They felt stable, and they didn't experience motion sickness. We also tried uh, an example of this sort of beyond real locomotion interaction from the literature known as the seven league boots. In this interaction, you maintain your body scale, but every step that you take, your displacement is amplified along your walking direction. So it has the same effect. And here I'm showing that at 10x speed up, where every step takes you 10 times uh, further, further, but um, you kind of maintain your body scale. And when we tried this with our participants, we had 18 participants within subject study design trying both of these interactions. We found that people felt unstable, they felt motion sickness, and they weren't actually able to stop accurately at these target positions that we had. And so these are example two kind of 
uh, sample design points in a really large design space of what kind of transformations we could have tried to have this effect of uh, effect, uh, efficient walking in VR. And what we did was we tried them out. We had this empirical evaluation. But here, what I want to argue is that we need to have ways of more systematically investigating these designs in addition to kind of this empirical approach, because this design space is so large. And I'd argue that in order to do so, we need to understand perception and action. So how we perceive sensory information and perceive the world, and how, in turn, we act and move in the world. So now I want to return to kind of this um, diagram that I had in terms of how our brain plans and controls movement and more explicitly position VR interactions in this context. So VR, really what it's doing is that it's intercepting all the sensory signals. So when you move your hand forward uh, in the real world, this movement is being sensed and tracked and then transformed into some virtual rendering. And so the brain is receiving sensory information from both the real world and the virtual system. You feel your joints and muscles in your real arm, but visually you're seeing your virtual avatar's arm moving in VR. So one way we can describe beyond real interactions is that they apply a transformation to this movement that is not a one-to-one -one mapping. So, and this really results in a sensory conflict. You feel the forces in your real hand, your real arm, uh, that give you information about where your real hand is. But in the virtual world, you're getting com completely conflicting information of where your um, uh, virtual hand is. And this discrepancy is not subtle like the previous interactions that I showed you where you could kind of ignore it and resolve it but you actually notice and have access to this conflicting information. So in a recent work, uh, we provide kind of a conceptual framework using this sensory motor lens to be able to describe VR interactions that go beyond what's possible in the real world that allows us to think about what is the sensory information that the user is receiving both from the real world and the virtual system across different uh, sensory systems and how that affects the internal model and is influenced by the internal model in return. So I want to use uh, kind of this framing to go back to the two examples of locomotion techniques that I talked to you about to kind of describe um, what kind of predictions we could have had. In the case of I'm a giant, you're kind of turning into a giant. You're walking around this miniature world. This might be an experience you've had when you went to an amusement park or um, when you were a child, you had this experience of having a different kind of scale towards the, your surroundings. But also, you have visual information that is able to provide insight to your internal model so you can predict what will happen when you take a step further. When you take a step, you know and expect the outcome of that, and you know how far you're going to get. So this, there's no kind of um, unexpected outcome in the internal model. But going back to the seven link boots, what's happening here is that, first of all, there's no visual information. You, everything looks normal. You have no expectations of what your movements will do until after you take a step and realize that your motion is being amplified. But also, when you start walking, from the real world, you're getting uh, information through your inner ear of your vestibular system telling you what your linear acceleration is. But visually, you're seeing the virtual world move at a very different linear acceleration. And this is kind of this is something that the brain cannot predict. It cannot understand how this could be possible. And depending on individual differences, this is known to cause motion sickness, especially at really high gains, like 10 times, going 10 times faster. So by kind of thinking about these different sensory signals and how they interact and integrate, we're able to have more intuitions about which, which of these designs will work better than the other before we actually implement them and go out and try it out with uh, different people. So today in my talk, I talked to you about three projects. Um, I used haptic retargeting to improve the perceived accuracy of drones when you, they were used for haptics. Then I talk, talked about how we use these techniques 
for improving the perceived speed of tabletop robots and talked about how we could add a predictive layer in order to kind of decide when it would make sense for us to apply these illusions versus not. And then I talked about kind of more of a haptic contour following task, where once you arrive at a, a haptic device, we can also use these haptic illusions to make um, these devices appear as if they were able to render haptic sensations at a higher resolution. So these three projects, um, they used illusions to improve um, the haptic device's performance and create this kind of realistic haptic rendering. In the second half of my talk, um, I talked about these beyond real interactions that allowed us to extend our abilities and provided an example of this interaction and also a kind of a conceptual framework to how to think about them and move towards kind of having more predictive models uh, in the future. So in terms of what I hope I was able to demonstrate in my talk, I showed that uh, illusory interactions can be used to improve haptic devices. I showed these implemented in three different haptic device systems and also um, did user evaluation of this, these systems to not only demonstrate how they work and find the limitations of the haptic interactions, but also find out more about limitations of our perception and different kind of sensory thresholds. I also described beyond real interactions and how they can be used to extend our abilities beyond what we can do uh, in, in the physical world. I presented a conceptual framework for us to think about haptic uh, virtual reality interactions in the context of how the brain plans and controls movement and use that to be able to understand sensory conflict and different sensory information that we're receiving from different sources. And I also presented a user evaluation of two different beyond real interactions and talked about how the framework could be extended to potentially have predictive power in the future. So through remapping users' movements in these two kind of two parts, we were able to not only overcome the current limitations of VR technology, more specifically haptic te technology, but we were able to kind of overcome the limitations of our real world interactions and what we can do in the real world. So in terms of future work and uh, open challenges, I think uh, as, as a field, we're trying to design usable VR interactions and we need to have ways of evaluating these interactions more systematically. So I think we need to move towards kind of building tools that integrate our, understand, our understand, understanding of human perception and sensory motor control to allow us to uh, have this sort of predictive power before we go out and try it out with users. And I think simulation is going to play a really important role in how we try different alternatives in advance. Also something that I didn't really talk about in my talk today is uh, the importance of individual differences. People have different sensory motor abilities but also different perceptual sensitivities and all of these influence motor control. And I think we need to have better ways of hopefully while maintaining privacy, capturing users' behaviors and using our understanding of sens sensory motor control to be able to adapt interactions to those individual people. All the uh, projects I talked to you about were presented in this context of virtual reality, but also another open challenge is how do we take those findings and uh, take them to a space like augmented reality where we don't have as much control over uh, kind of what sensory information the user is receiving, what they're attending to, and they're kind of going on about their lives, and how do we handle that kind of complexity of the real world and the uncertainty that comes with that. Uh, these are the credits for the artworks that I used in my talk. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So one thing I'm curious is in the, the three haptic illusion papers you showed, especially with like drones, these are noisy devices, right? And I'm wondering if you ever saw an effect where like literally the noise of the drone affected someone's perception of the illusion, of the world, of the virtual or the physical reality. 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if people on Zoom were able to hear, but the question was around the noise of these devices, specifically the drones. So in all of these studies, we use noise canceling headphones. And that is not very unusual. Most people in VR will be wearing headphones anyways. Um, and what is nice is that the frequency of this drone uh, kind of noise is consistent. And so headphones are really good at kind of eliminating that. Um, I can't say that people totally weren't able to hear it, but it definitely helped a lot. Um, another thing that you didn't mention is the wind and the kind of airflow from the drone. So people definitely noticed that, especially when the drone was close to them. Um, and what was surprising from the findings was that people kind of liked that aspect of the interactions because it gave them this kind of ambient sense of where the drone was relative to them. So without having to pay attention to it, they felt safe when they weren't feeling the noise or wind. And when, it, when they expected it to be close to them, that was kind of re reassuring in terms of what they expected from the interaction. So something to think about for the future. But in the meantime, it had this kind of uh, surprising effect than what we expected. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a question on Zoom from uh, uh, Hello? Oh, oh, it's an audio question. <laughs> I thought you were going to read it out. <laughs> Hi. Congratulations, class two. Thank Your you. dad was a graduate student of mine decades ago. I won't specify, oh. I won't specify the number of decades. Uh, the question I have is this. Uh, do you think someday we can wear something on our fingers, like a small uh, device that induces the sense of touch rather than relying on physical objects that we have to move around? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so there are a, a variety of other haptic devices other than the encounter type haptic devices that I focused on in my work that include kind of wearable devices that use vibrotactile actuators and not physical sen sensations and other things. And there, are, there is actually a lot of work on using haptic uh, illusions to make these kind of vibrations and other uh, sensations appear differently than they are. So uh, yeah, definitely that's um, something that people are working on. I think why I'm excited about these type of encounter type haptics is that they don't require you to wear anything. And so you could kind of go on about your day and interact with things the way you do and, and still uh, be able to interact with these haptic devices. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when you were on the first one on the accuracy part, when they were trying to hold the clothes or the hanger, uh, do you um, sort of when, when you hold like a, a hanger itself because it there's weight in in the, in, in the actual stuff, uh, do you actually like press harder on on the user's finger or something because it's you know it's carrying something so. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, so drones definitely have limitations in terms of what kind of force feedback they can provide. Um, and especially kind of moving vertically, there's certain kind of forces that you could apply. And, and because of that, um, yeah, I, I can't say we had like a lot of control in terms of how much weight rendering we were able to do. Um, but the illusions that I talked about could apply to all these different devices that could be used for different uh, sort of haptic sensations. So we were kind of focusing mainly on arriving at a physical object, feeling the texture, but um, we didn't have so much uh, ability in terms of rendering different force, uh, forces and weights and stiffnesses. Yeah. Yeah, drones are under actually. Yeah. Uh, we have another question on Zoom. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm just wondering, like, yeah, like, I think maybe like a follow up question is, you know, uh, how would you be able to feel these kinds of physical objects um, while you were in the virtual world without you necessarily having to interface to say the, the physical world first, right? Because a lot of the um, devices that you have, you have to, you know, put your hand on the object first before you start the experience. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I totally followed your question. Um, are you asking if we could do haptic rendering without a physical device? Yeah, I'm saying, like, how could you in more seamlessly integrate the physical devices mm -hmm. um, into the virtual reality without, you know, having the conscious perception that this is a physical device, you know, actually doing things? Yeah. Uh, does uh, that make sense? Or no? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think okay. there are a range of haptic devices you could have. So you could have these kind of encounter type physical surfaces that may be suitable for certain applications, but then you can move into more kind of wearable, vibrotactile devices if you're kind of only looking for physical cues. Um, and, and there's also kind of work on uh, using electrical mus mu muscle stimulation as a way of kind of uh, triggering your uh, neurons instead of kind of interacting with physical world. So there's definitely a range. Um, and I think they'll make sense in different contexts depend on, depending on the interactions and the applications of VR. Thank you. Great. Yep, I, I don't know who went <laughs> first. But yeah, the person at the back. Yep. Um, yeah, I noticed in a lot of the examples were reaching out to touch with one finger, and I was wondering, were they instructed to do that, or did any of the illusions function differently if people were to like reach out with an open palm and try to kind of do this motion? Yeah, that's a great question. So the case with the, um, the first project, the drone, people were not instructed to touch with a finger, and we tried to kind of estimate their, uh, basically we were tracking the back of their hand and we had enough surface area in terms of textile that uh, we were able to kind of um, provide that te texture regarding of like regardless of how many fingers they used. Um, but the example with the shape display was very much kind of like one finger interactions. That's a great question to think about. Um, what happens when you use your full hand kind of following a contour? Um, and I, my, my hypothesis would be that having more fingers and you having information about the relative positions of your finger could kind of give you more information uh, in terms of what is happening in, in the real world. So that is something that I haven't studied in the context of kind of redirecting your finger, but that's a great question. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have a, another question on Zoom. Perhaps do a great talk. Um, Thank you. Just ha happen to have an interesting question uh, that, that, uh, that I came up with. So for the Beyond Real Interaction Framework, you mentioned it can be used for evaluation. I wonder uh, what, uh, how would you imagine the workflow would be uh, for other researcher or practitioner to use your model to design their own Beyond Real Interaction system? Is that, is that possible? Is there any recommended workflow? Yeah, um, so in our recent Kai paper, we do like a walk through example of how it could be applied. And we have more examples in the appendix where um, people can kind of break down their interaction design, thinking about what sensory information people are receiving from the physical world and the real world and how they might integrate. Um, what I would say, though, is that I think the takeaway from that paper uh, was that there is a lot that we know about human sensory motor control and perception, but there's a lot we don't know, especially when it comes to applying them into a kind of open-ended interaction design as opposed to kind of um, these control neuroscience or psychology studies that people have done before. And so there, there, are, all, there are a lot of gaps in terms of how much we can uh, leverage prior work in uh, having more predictive power, and, and we try to kind of um, ex expand on these open research questions uh, in the future as well. But yeah, thank you so much. So we have, uh, one last that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious about like your, you know, the open question that you put out, the AR one. You can't fool people because they can see, you know, the AR, the illusions like uh, these types, and uh, people don't use controllers in AR. So what would be the uh, ways to enrich the interaction like uh, in AR? Yeah, that's a great question. So I wouldn't, so there, you're totally right in that we don't have the ability to totally block a certain sense and replace it with whatever visual renderings there are. 
but there is way, ways in which you could overwrite some information. And so the example that I showed with um, you having an, a longer arm, this is there's a paper from Kai from a few years ago where they tried this in AR. And you can imagine you could have an extension of your arm in AR that allows you to kind of interact with virtual objects that are at a distance. So there are both ways in which you can extend the kind of real world um, views of of what people are seeing, but also there's ways you can kind of trick um, them in terms of what you overlay visually on top of the physical world and how I think perception will become really important in that con context as well, using light and shade and using these illusions in terms of how you're rendering virtual content. Um, and also, vision is not the only sense, right? You could have auditory illusions and using audio as a way of kind of uh, giving uh, ambient information to people as they're interacting in the, in the physical world and in other senses as well. But yeah, that's a great kind of open research space, I think. Okay, so we should wrap it up and give Carrasco another great